architect and planner at Kimley Horn. I, uh, we're, I'm, I'm joined here today by a couple of my colleagues as well from Kimley Horn, and we're here to discuss some of the challenges and opportunities that we've seen in the single family for rent market over the last few years. I will say that this is really meant to be a single family for rent 101 presentation. While we'll get into a few of the details that tend to be challenging from a site planning exercise, this is not meant to cover every single item that might come up. So just a couple of house cleaning items, um, housekeeping items. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is being recorded and um, you can, after the presentation, get onto the link that will be sent to you and find the recording as well as contacts to other professionals at Kimley Horn that can help out in your local market. Um, we have a question and answer uh, area at the bottom of Zoom or wherever it's located on your screen. Feel free to type in your questions as we go along and we'll try to answer those as we go along in the presentation or field them at the end, we will have a little bit of time to discuss questions then. So as I said, I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues, Joseph Hornisher and Lori Lusk are both civil engineers with Kimley Horn. And as many of you know, Kimley Horn is a nationwide firm. We've um, got over 4,500 individuals. And in the next slide, you'll see we've got, we just completed our 200 million multifamily unit nationwide. We have so many single family units. I don't know that anybody in the company could even count them, but why that's important is that this product type, the single family for rent product type kind of fits in the middle of those two. And so we've got experience that bookends that product type and we've been developing that product type with our, our developer friends for the last few years as well. So I like to say from big to small, we do it all. We work on one acre, small little commercial pads all the way up to 20,000 plus acre master plans. And we do everything on the site from site civil to structural engineering, basically anything outside of the envelope we can address. And that's important as well, because as you look at this product type, you'll see in this presentation, this is, there's a lot of coordination that has to happen when you um, talk about these sites and having that expertise in house just puts you at a greater advantage for developing this parcel and we can help you along in that process. <clears throat> so today's agenda, we're gonna be talking about kind of the process and as I said, kind of challenges that we've seen over the last few years in developing this product type, anything from entitlement, site planning, we'll get into a little bit of grading and accessibility challenges. What are the things to, to think about as we go through water and sanitary sewer and then storm water? And you'll see there's some icons on the screen here. These pop up throughout the presentation and represent what we think are kind of the most impactful things that you need to think about when addressing the uh, single family for rent product type. And I apologize, you guys can probably hear my Christmas clock in the background going off right now. Um, just a little holdover from Christmas, a little Christmas cheer. So if you guys are all here today, you've heard the buzz lately about the single family for rent product type. Um, it has just grown in popularity over the last year and the few years before that. Um, and that's primarily driven by this market sector that hasn't been served very well in the market in the past. And that includes um, college, people coming out of college for the first time that aren't quite ready to buy a house, but they want to not live in an apartment anymore. They want the same amenities that they would get in an apartment, but they're not quite ready to step into the purchasing of a house quite yet. They also might be testing out communities as well to see where they wanna kind of start building a family. And then that next um, market sector that we're seeing are that is that young family that are maybe growing out of their apartment. They've got maybe one or two kids. They want a little bit more space. They might not be financially ready to purchase a house, but they want that sense of community, the connection to community. They want the good schools that they could get in certain communities. They want to be able to get out and take walks and feel that they're safe within the community, that kind of thing. And then kind of the opposite end of that spectrum, we're seeing the empty nesters, those folks that no longer want a big maintenance um, nightmare in a house or, um, you know, they want to stay connected to the community, but 
they want to be able to leave and go on vacation or go see their family, that lock and leave lifestyle. And fitting into that uh, spectrum as well as kind of the business person that might have a house somewhere else in the country and so they don't want to purchase but they're there more on a long-term lease basis throughout the year. And then um, we've seen a rise certainly over the last year in um, the desire to have more of a home as it relates to COVID-19 and the impacts that it's had on us socially where we're seeing more people wanna get out of apartments. They want to have space. They want to have the amenities. They wanna be able to get out in a backyard and have space to kind of spread out. And that's really been fueling the flames of this uh, market rise that we've seen in the last year for sure. And so where does single family for rent fit in? If we're talking about these kind of different um, market sectors, this product really helps to to fill a gap that we currently have. Um, this is really about density in many ways. It also fills that need um, for the, the end user. We call this in planning the missing middle. There's a lot of this product that's not out there that could hit that um, missing uh, market. And what we see, of course, on the low end of the spectrum with single family, you know, you're half acre to four and a half to five units per acre. You get into the duplex uh, townhome range and you can take that up to, you know, eight units per acre. You might get into nine depending on your requirements for open space and accessibility and, and those kinds of things. And then there's a big gap and this is that missing middle. There's a big gap between that and what you're seeing in a courtyard apartment, which is, you know, 20 units per acre all the way up to 28 units per acre, depending on parking and open space and city requirements and, and all of that. So this, you can see in the bottom of the screen how this product can end up being pretty dense, um, but it's still a single family home. And um, you know we've seen different mixed reactions to, from cities and Joseph's gonna talk a little bit about that, but this, um, this what this kind of drives home is that, um, this addresses a concern in the community, um, this product type does, when you're talking to other single family owners, the, those folks that say not in my backyard, uh, they don't want apartments, but this kind of, because it's a, a lower story, you know, it's, it's only kind of two stories max, it's not getting up in that three to five story range, they're much more um, accepting of this product type. And with that, it makes it a little bit more easy, you know, for cities to be accepting of it too. And we're going to talk a little bit next on the next slide about entitlements. I'm going to hand it off to Joseph and he's going to talk a little bit more about that kind of city interaction. Thanks, Emily. Um, so yeah, thanks for kind of establishing the baseline as far as, you know, why it's needed in the community. And so now what we're shifting into is well, how are the cities and the entitlements and how is it accepted? And so with that, we're, we're just gonna talk about entitlements and that's from a, a broad, from a high level, that's, you know, are you allowed to build your, this proposed use by right? Uh, meaning it's just staff approval or is there going to be some sort of modification to the zoning, which um, obviously means more risk and more risk means that uh, from a developer's perspective, you know, there, there's more challenges maybe with investors. Uh, with entitlements, similar to multifamily, single family, all the other uses, you really need to be cognizant of the future lane use map as well as your current zoning. Um, we are sort of in the, the middle, which, you know, there, there's some code or there's some interpretation of, well, the future land use map shows that this is supposed to be single family or it puts some parameters on it. And so it's, um, there is a little bit of gray area that you need to talk to the city about. Um, on this slide, what you'll notice, we have the two icons, time and money. Um, I have those and as well as code requirements. Uh, Entitlements, and this leads into the first question is, does the city have experience with single family for rent? And um, entitlements isn't a, you know, there, there's not a definitive end date. Um, there's a lot of times where you're working with staff to try to um, get on the same page, have something that they're supportive, 
but there could be multiple rounds. And that process, that timeline can be prolonged, especially if the city doesn't know what this, this product is. It's, it's very challenging to say, oh, well, you know, just go down the street and you can see our product. Um, oftentimes it's, well, we've, you've got to go to a different state or, you know, this is a new market we're entering. So all that to say, uh, at the very beginning, having um, an understanding of, is this the city's first experience with single family for rent is very important. And that sort of can help set your expectation of, uh, are, are we writing the code? Are we the, the trailblazers? And, you know, we'll, we'll get a couple of bumps and there'll be a couple of bumps along the way, but, um, you know, just setting expectations early. The second item, once, you know, we, we have an understanding of the city's familiarity is, okay, well, now what do we do with their code? Um, at this time, um, you know, we're often relying on ordinances, which take a while to, um, for them to be modified to target this specific category, this gap that Emily has mentioned. And so, and, and what we're seeing across uh, the nation is, is really a, a broad spectrum to how cities are responding. There are some cities who are, their code may be vague enough where, you know, we can just fall under a multifamily zoning, for instance, without really any very, um, any variances or deviations needed. And so you've, you've got multifamily entitlement and you just move straight ahead. Whereas other cities, even if it is entitled multifamily, they're saying, you know what, this is a new special classification. Um, you know, we actually need you to go to a PD, uh, a plan development. And so again, it's, it's the important thing to pick up here is cities are working what I'm finding is cities are working on incorporating and updating their ordinances. But in the meantime, we're stuck in this middle where cities across the nation are approaching it and handling it in different ways um, and, and just trying to figure it out. And that sort of leads into the, the third item that I'm sure lots of y'all are interested in is, well, what are the entitlement issues that entitlement challenges that we're facing? And so on the, the next slide, what you'll see is just a, a little example site plan. But with that, um, what I recommend is you really, because this is a new product type and there's going to be small changes, little differences between, uh, while they may be little differences, um, that they can become really impactful, especially as this sets the foundation for your project. So what are some of those items that you need to look for? Well, um, as most engineers will say, well, every site, every city is different. You really need to uh, have your team um, understand the city's requirements be on the ground, as well as understanding your product. And then once you have that, going through the city code to kind of line by line, and identifying, okay, here's something that may be in conflict. Let's talk to the city to see how they want to proceed with this. Some of those items that we commonly see include, you know, what is the base zoning? For example, in the future land use map example, you know, is this single family? Is it multifamily? Um, and all those little codes and items that may be stuck throughout the, um, the zoning ordinance, which way is the city going to... Um, to classify this development as. Oftentimes it probably see it as multifamily, but it's a, it's a question you need to ask. Uh, another example of where that plays out and where it can be very impactful to the site is your buffer requirements. And, and this is actually an example where we can see it swing the other way to single family in that, you know, is this single family next to single family? Well, from the you know, end user who's driving by kind of looks that way. Whereas, or is it single family next to multifamily? So all of the buffer, the screening requirements, they impact developable land, they impact what you're doing around the perimeter and cost. Um, so those are just items to specifically pay attention to. Um, other unique items, um, you know, are you approaching this as a single lot with uh, several homes and community homes on the site? Or are you treating this even more like single family where you've got uh, several uh, kind of 
individual lots with private access easements or something like that. So that's a very important thing to establish and discuss early with cities. In my experience, I, I'm not seeing a lot of cities um, taking the multiple lot approach, but I know that developers are asking for that. Um, open space, you can see that with open space, um, traditionally you've got these big open areas, whereas in single family for rent, the areas are much smaller, you know, five feet here, 10 feet there. Some cities have requirements on, we're not allowing you to count, you know, backyards at, for your open, to meet open space requirements or unless it's a certain size, we're not gonna allow you to count that. And so these are, are little details that really um, can become impactful if, if you find out about them you know, two, three months into the design process. Uh, last couple items I'll want to hit on, building separation, that's a key driver in the density that you can get. It is connected to some other factors as Lori will mention. Um, as well as things like building variation. So some cities are starting to apply sort of a, a single family perspective of uh, making sure that you have variation in your units so that it just isn't, you know, the, the same building over and over. And even more so, we're also seeing some cities even um, add requirements that, you know, that they can't be in a straight row that you've, you've got to uh, mix it up, I guess, a little bit. So it's, it's what I'll, I'll leave with on the, zone, on the zoning and entitlements discussion is it's, I, I would recommend just making sure that you and your team pair up with a, a local resource that can review your, t uh, your product type, as well as they're familiar with the city requirements. And so they can see where those two items may be in conflict so that we can establish what the course of action is moving forward. So as we continue to get into more detail, I'm going to pass it back to Emily so that she can start talking about some of the other site um, items you should consider. Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Um, one of the things you just brought up, I think is, is real important for everyone to, to note is that when um, you're dealing with one of these projects and dealing with the local hyper local market, um, it's important to have a friend on the ground, if you would. Kimley Horn obviously has folks all over the nation that can help out. Um, one of the key things we bring to the table too is often we know the characters involved, the city council or the, the mayor, we know what's kind of happening politically because we are plugged into those local environments. So that's also helpful as we're bringing these projects through the entitlement process. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about site planning as we're going from that 5,000 foot level down. And the key thing to remember about site planning is coordination. Joseph talked a lot about different items you gotta think about as you're going through the entitlement process. One of the um, big things that stands out here is in this uh, slide is you can see the density of this product type. Now, this product type is one of many that could be developed in the single family for rent market. This is what we're calling kind of the, the cottage style um, home. There's also kind of a cluster uh, style that Joseph showed in the last slide. We've also seen these as townhomes and duplexes, and that kind of varies um, depending on what market you're in, whether you're in Florida or Texas or Arizona, uh, what that market demand is. And so there's various product types, number one, that you need to, to know about as you're beginning that site planning exercise. And the other thing you need to think about is just the coordination of, of all these elements, um, even from the process that you go through. So a lot of times we'll get involved really early on when a client comes to us and says, hey, I've got this piece of land. I'm thinking about doing single family for rent. I'd like to get 12 units per acre on it. Um, and I think that's something I didn't mention previously in that missing middle bucket. This, this falls between the nine, nine unit per acre to 12 to 14 units per acre, depending on your site. And this is a perfect example. They might come to us and have perfectly rectangular site no topo issues, there's um, no trees, there's no tree mitigation, there's no floodplain. The city is on board with it, they understand it, they're excited about it. 
and they might say, hey, I need 12 units per acre on the site. And we can very quickly kind of look at it and do a real quick site plan and confirm that they're able to get to that density before they even go through the entitlement process. And that's really important that the design process is a cyclical kind of element. So we go through design, we, we figure out what those parameters are for entitlement that we're willing to um, either uh, write into a PD or make variances of their existing code. And then, you know, we go through another iteration to make sure that that's uh, really where you want to be, or maybe the product changes or the number changes or something like that. You know, on the other hand, we'll get a client that comes in the door with a triangular shape site. They've got all of these issues. There's topo, there's tree mitigation, there's floodplain. The neighbors are single family and they're not quite sure what this product is. And the city maybe doesn't quite understand what this product is. And there's challenges with it. And they still say, hey, I want uh, 12 units per acre, we can pretty quickly look at that one and say, well, you you might get more in the range of nine units per acre with this. And, and that might be a, a non-starter for the client. And we're able to, to help them off, help them out pretty quickly in determining where they can um, kind of sit with that um, density um, to give them a, a good feeling going forward into the entitlement process. So there's multiple things to think about when you're talking about site coordination, uh, site planning and, and coordination. You can see it's a very dense site. There's things like backyards. So think about topography and backyards. If you've got a lot of slope, how are you going to um, make those grade changes work? You know, you've got um, parking. These these streets have parking on them on the streets. Are those streets public or are they private? How does that get drained? And, and Lori's going to talk a lot about that a little bit later on. But on the next slide, you can see a couple of the examples uh, images. You know, these are all kind of choices that de the developer makes, and it impacts your density. It impacts your um, basically your your. Uh, profitability at the end. You know, whether this really looks and feels like a single family home, is it more like a town home? Is it more of a cottage style kind of community? Is it a two story product that might get you more density, but what does that, um, what is the, um, the negative out of that? Um, challenges with parking or challenges with um, utilities at that point. You know, you can see backyards are, are a big, um, uh, driver or a, a big amenity for this this product type. You can see how small they can end up getting that uh, picture on the kind of middle right there, how small that backyard is. It's only 10 feet wide. And so how do you get utilities in through these corridors? How do you drain that element when you've got a, a solid fence all the way around it? Um, you know, garages, Lori's going to talk a lot about garages in a little bit. Um, we'll some tell you some of the challenges with them. You've, you know, you've got different garage types, are they attached to the unit? Are they freestanding? Is it really more of a carport situation? And then open space. Many people are coming to the development because they want that desire to have an open space like they have an amenity like they have at their apartment buildings or something like that. And so what is that market that you're really reaching out to appropriately sizing those open space components and making sure that, that, that you're getting your um, your uh, open space requirement met by the city, by those elements, that's key. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Lori so she can talk a little bit more about this accessibility and grading issue. Thanks, Emily. Um, so now that we've covered entitlements and site planning, I'm gonna get a little bit more technical and touch on um, some of the design considerations, starting with grading elements that are um, critical to consider as you start to grade your site. Um, so these are the four topics we're going to cover. Um, it's ADA and fair housing requirements, garage access, retaining walls, and just a couple of other um, grading challenges that you need to be aware of and thinking through as you go through the process. So the first, ADA standards. It's important that you know how they relate to your site and knowing do they apply and to what portions. And one key in determining this is whether your site is privately funded or publicly funded and whether you're gated or not gated. Um, every state has dif different accessibility requirements that are gonna impact how you're required to comply with these rules and regulations. On the next slide, uh, you'll see an example. This is from Texas Code, um, but the state has certain exemptions to ADA rules and regulations for site improvements. 
this rule is Architectural Barriers Administrative Rule 6830. Um, it has a residential exemption that states those portions of publicly or privately funded apartments, condos, townhomes, and single family dwellings used exclusively by residents and their guests. So it's been my experience that in the state of Texas, if you are privately funded and you're gated, the only portion of your site that is required to meet ADA requirements um, as far as accessibility on the, the site improvements goes are those where the general public can access. So that would be like something like your leasing center, um, probably your amenity center because there would be guests there. Um, and then anything outside the gates or in public rights of way. So given that every location is a little bit different, um, I would encourage each of you to reach out to a registered accessibility specialist in your region that your site specific, specific requirements for the buildings to make sure that they'll comply with all applicable um, ADA and fair housing objectives. On the next slide, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, garage access. Um, this is going to be particularly true for garages that directly about the fire lane, but it's looking at your grading and in, in detail and knowing if your residents are going to be able to access their garage without bottoming out. Um, when you grade the site, particularly on sites with significant topo, um, you need to really consider the slope of the fire lanes and consider the access into the garage bays. Depending on your ability to break the foundations in between each bay and how many bays your garage building have, this might slightly restrict the maximum slope that you can have on your fire lanes. The perfect example of this is a project that I just completed work on. Um, we had a significant amount of topo across the site. And when we did our initial grading plan, our fire lane was approaching 5% in one area, um, just in order to minimize the height of a perimeter retaining wall. But what we didn't think about is that while we were doing the grading, um, we needed to think about the finished floors of the garage and how they're gonna be set. And what we found is that that 5% slope that we used caused too much of a gray change across our four bay garage building for the downstream um, garage bay to be accessed without a car bottoming out or even a car accessing at all. Um, so that left us with two options. The first being place foundation breaks in between every single garage bay or the second being regrade the site and potentially relocate some of the garage buildings so that they're on fire lanes with a flatter slope. In our particular situation, um, we ended up doing the latter of those two and we regraded our site um, so that our fire lanes abutting the garages were no steeper than 2%. And then if we had to have a fire lane that was a little bit steeper, we moved garages off of that fire lane. Um, it just didn't make financial sense for our client um, to place breaks in between each of the garage foundations for each building. Um, these same considerations would also apply if you've got a larger block of buildings, kind of like a townhome set up that directly abut the fire lane. Um, the next thing we we're gonna talk about is retaining wall placement. Um, it's really critical to think about where you're placing retaining walls and be mindful of what's happening under the surface. Really think through whether there's water, sewer, landscaping, um, landscape drains, franchise facilities, those types of things running in the area. And really think through um, the ability to maintain those facilities after the wall is constructed near, nearby. It's also important to consider the placement of your condenser pads, private yard fences, or other um, external building obstructions that'll be on the ground to make sure that there's enough room for them and to maintain the area around them with a wall nearby. Um, a specific example of this is shown on your screen. Um, this is from a project we are working on. Um, when we started the grading design, our client and the architectural team hadn't quite finished their architectural plans or their MEP plans. Um, and we had some uncertainty about what units um, would have private yards, whether it was only a few, whether it was all of them, whether we weren't doing them at all. Um, but we wanted to keep pressing forward to our city submittal. So we went ahead and continued grading the site based on our approved zoning site plan and the grading criteria we knew um, from the developer. Um, what we learned is that after completion, the architectural and the MEP plans were completed, 
and we learned that the buildings had gotten slightly larger by a foot or two. Um, the condensers were located on the ground instead of on the roof of the building. Um, and we learned a couple of other things, but based on this information that we learned, um, our site plan actually, and our grading plan actually no longer worked and our site plan would no longer comply with our approved um, zoning site plan. We had to move several buildings further apart to accommodate the yards, to accommodate um, the condenser pads. The, um, and we also had to move out the retaining walls just due to space constraints and ease of future maintenance. Um, we also, and this is kind of a larger impact, um, ended up having to swap out a couple of building types for smaller units. Um, just due to constraints now with the retaining walls and all these other obstructions. So having to swap out the, the units for smaller ones, that has an overall impact on the project financials for the client. So I say all of this to remind you how impactful such seemingly minor details can be on such a dense site. And while they're easily addressed and solved, they impact the overall project timeline and project financials. So I would encourage you early on in the process while you're doing your site plan, to try to nail down where some of these obstructions will be, um, know most of the constraints, and really think through where you might need walls so that you can leave adequate room and save yourself the headaches of moving buildings around later during the design process. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk about, and we'll get into it a little bit more later in the presentation, but it's thinking through how your water is gonna get through the site to the um, stormwater facilities think through where the obstructions are that the water has to get through, you know, where through the buildings, the private yards, your landscaping. Um, generally these sites are dense and there's limited space between each unit. So that means limited sunlight can reach the soil and dry up any moisture. So in order to um, minimize the potential for standing water or soggy grass and landscaping, make sure you provide a path with adequate slope. Um, away from the buildings and out to the fire lane or storm drain as um, efficiently as possible. Um, later in the presentation, I'll get a fairly detailed talk into stormwater and I'll talk about one other consideration um, during that part of the presentation. But these considerations are critical to consider when designing your site in order to minimize costs, ease future maintenance, and to ensure that your site uh, drains well, making it a better community for your end user. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Joseph so he can talk about water and sewer design considerations. Thanks, Emily. And so, uh, or thanks, Lori, I apologize for that. Um, so can we actually go back one slide, please? And um, what, I'd, what we're gonna talk now, and this was actually one of the questions that has already popped up is, um, you know, water and sanitary sewer, the, the costs associated with them, what are some things that uh, developers should start considering whenever they're, um, you know, trying to perform, produce their pro formas. And so with traditional, uh, you know, garden style developments, water and sanitary sewer are sort of, they are what they are, you just fit them on the site and they have an impact, but you just kind of roll them in. Uh, with single family for rent, what we're seeing is that it's actually much more impactful. It can also impact your, it can impact your density um, from one perspective. Uh, and number two, it can impact your construction costs. So we're gonna look at the, those two items in kind of three stages. The impact fees that are associated with your, we'll say your upfront fees um, during permitting. Then the, the second item would be your infrastructure costs or your construction costs. And then third, sort of, if you are holding this product, the long-term maintenance costs um, based on some of the decisions that are made at this point. One of the caveats that I'll, I'll immediately start with is um, cities, are, cities are used to um, you know, certain procedures and, and going about uh, having their infrastructure in a certain way. And so, while some cities may be open to alternate approaches, some of the approaches we're gonna talk about, uh, some cities will say, I definitely want you to go the mass, uh, what we'll call the master meter route, and we'll discuss later. While the other, another city will say, absolutely not, that's not even allowed. Um, and so there's this ongoing kind of back and forth between cities. And the problem is the developers in the middle and it impacts layout and it impacts cost. So understanding 
um, kind of city expectations and, and how to build those in early is, is what we're going to talk through. So on the next slide, we're just going to walk through a quick example because I, I think pictures explain this best. Um, we have a, a potential site plan. We're just looking at the, the green area on the, on the left for now. And so on the next slide, what you'll see is, and this is something that we're starting to see. I know I've talked to my uh, colleagues out in the east, um, and this even happens in a couple of the DFW metroplexes, which is master metering. That's where you have it one large, one or two large meters at the property line, and then everything internal to the site is private. So with this, the other caveat I'm putting is some cities even have your private fire hydrants um, running off of this line. And so what that can do is your master meter size can, um, can increase, which is directly tied to your impact fees. And, and those fees can quickly grow. Um, one of the services that Kimley Horn can provide is we can do some flow modeling and just model, you know, what are the head losses along the site? What, um, what is the, um, you know, the meter size that is required in order to, um, to hopefully bring that, that size down and, um, and, and be more accurate. The, you know, the advantages of the master meter is the infrastructure is all private. So on a dense site, you've got a little more flexibility in, you know, what you can do and where you can place it uh, because it's not a public line that the city has to maintain. The con is, well, it's your line, you've got to maintain it. So it's sort of um, making sure that when there's a water leak or when there's an issue, it's, it's a private line that you are prepared to uh, maintain it. The next slide shows a very similar with a small difference. And this is where we've found that some cities, uh, they want you to master meter. So um, again, just the meters at the property line, but because they have concerns with the, um, you know, servicing fire hydrants and providing fire service, they actually want you to run a dual, uh, a dual loop next to the private system that is just providing service to all the fire hydrants. Now, this is impactful. While your impact, your meter size may be reduced, um, what, what happens instead is, well, now you've got all this double infrastructure and this, some of this infrastructure is public, meaning it takes up more space. Space is a premium if you haven't uh, uh, caught on to that yet. The, the third option, and again, I've, uh, on the next slide that we've, have is what we'll call sort of master or cluster meters or individual meters for each unit. Um, I know that one city, for example, again says, based on our interpretation of the code, um, sub metering is not allowed in for this unit type. We want individual meters for each unit. Other cities are saying, you know what, we could have one meter serve up to 10 units or whatever. Um, you know, whatever the calculations and whatever makes sense. There is a little bit of engineering um, that we can provide where we work with the MEP inside the building and the flows to determine, okay, looking at the impact fees, looking at what the city will allow, I think it makes the most sense for, and the site layout, I think it makes the most sense to have a, a cluster meter layout where you're going with a two inch meter that's serving X number of homes. That's all sort of an analysis that can be completed to, to try and figure out what the best path forward to minimize those impact fees. In this scenario, you've got more uh, public infrastructure, the, the main running through the site, connecting all of the meters, all the blue dots would be public, but then still all the laterals running to each building are private. So another sort of long-term cost that uh, may pop up is well, now, if you've got 10, 15, 20, 30 meters on site, um, you know, the, the city has minimum usage charges. And so if each of those meters aren't pulling enough demand, well, now you've got all of these, um, these city fees that are incurred just, they, they may be small, but, you know, again, when you have lots of these meters, they can potentially add up. The, uh, the last thing that 
we'll talk about is we'll take a little bit of look at a sanitary sewer layout to express this point. And that has to do with, um, you know, whose code are we reviewing and what design standards are we building this to? So traditionally, um, you know, we're as an engineer, I'm following, um, you know, the engineering manual, public works and their manuals for the infrastructure throughout the site. And there's a handoff as we get to the building of, okay, now that we're within five feet, um, the, the MEP takes over and um, they're building per building code and plumbing, international plumbing code. And that's part of the building inspection. What we're finding on this product is that handoff that line is moving closer to what we'll call the, the main street in the middle of the road. And that's causing some confusion. So there's some benefits in that uh, the plumbing code is a little more nimble in that it can snake in between all of these units. Uh, the challenge, become, and you know, they, they've got different design requirements, different material requirements, just it, it, it's a different code. There, there are similarities, but there are uh, definitely differences. And what we're finding is, um, you know, sometimes those conversations where we're trying to identify, you know, what code are we following happens pretty early in the process. And then by the time it makes it out into the field, well, you know, the constructor or the inspector who's been doing this for 10, 15 years is like, wait, that's not how we do this. That's not what I've typically done. And that can cause some confusion and potential delays. And so with that, I think it's pretty important that throughout the process, continuing to follow up with the city and, and um, making sure that we're all on the same page of as this is a new product type and as it's a little bit non-standard from what maybe the inspectors or what different levels of the, uh, the staff may be used to, we're all on the same page because um, what we're trying to avoid is the, the potential construction, the delay that occurs during construction when it is, uh, it is even more impactful and, and definitely important. So with that, I will pass it back to, uh, to Lori so she can talk through stormwater. Thanks, Joseph. So we're going to hit on four um, key items related to uh, stormwater. The first one is runoff rates. Uh, what we're finding is that depending on your site configuration, um, the single family for rent sites, they trend towards a lower runoff coefficient than a traditional multifamily or commercial use, but they're slightly higher um, because we're more dense than a standard single family use. Uh, so this means that your stormwater facilities will likely be um, somewhere in between the single family and the multifamily requirements. These lower runoff rates means that the, the stormwater facilities will be smaller and less land will be taken up for your stormwater detention and water quality ponds, which, will, which results in lower cost for you um, and more developable land to um, maximize the number of units on your, your project. So this is why we think it's critical that you really consider these coefficients early on when you're designing your um, stormwater system to make sure that you're using appropriate stormwater coefficients. The next thing is how is your stormwater system going to be classified? Is it going to be classified as a public system or a private system? Very similar to what Joseph mentioned on the water and sewer side. This is going to be generally determined by the municipality. They're going to tell you whether your system is public or private. Um, if the city is going to consider your system private, there might be, um, in some cases, not in all, but there might be an opportunity to utilize um, some kind of non-standard materials, maybe to utilize HDPE or another kind of non-standard material that's um, suited for this application in lieu of your standard RCP. Um, so knowing how your system's classified early on might help you identify some cost savings. Um, it's also important to know whether you're public or private so that you can determine, like better determine the configuration of your stormwater system um, and know if the municipality is going to allow you to use a valley section with great inlets versus um, a more standard street section with curb inlets. Um, it's been my experience that if you're private, you generally have more flexibility in how you um, configure your stormwater system. 
you might have the ability to utilize a valley section with great inlets versus the standard street section with curb inlets or even a valley section and then warping the pavement to um, get the drainage to a curb inlet or even using a straight uh, cross slope section with curb inlets. It's been my experience here in the DFW Metroplex that there are a couple of municipalities that they, whether you're public or private, they won't allow you to use great inlets. Um, so if, if you're working in a municipality and that's the case, you really need to give thought on how you're grading your fire line or fire lane, um, how you're grading your parking lot and where you're gonna strategically locate these curb inlets so that you can keep water um, out of your garages. Um, really thinking through these, uh, these different elements early on will help you configure your storm drain and asking these key questions to the municipality early on is key. Um, just again, so you can plan your site from the beginning, save yourself some headaches as you get into detailed design and later down the road. Um, the last element, um, I would really encourage you to consider using landscape drains. Um, it just helps move the water away from the buildings more efficiently, minimizing the potential for standing water around the units. Because um, as we mentioned, these sites are very dense. There is um, limited amounts of sunlight that can reach the ground and help you dry out the, all the, the standing water and runoff. Um, depending on the amount of rain that your area receives, like say if you're in Florida, for example, it might even be worth taking this one step further and tying your downspouts directly into the landscape drains and then into the storm sewer system. Again, that's just that much less runoff that hits the ground and has to find its way to the nearest drain um, and into your stormwater system. While it adds cost to your development, it could lead to um, a better quality community for your end user. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily and she's gonna wrap up the presentation. Great, thank you guys. Um, just a point to note also on those uh, landscape drains, one of the things we've kind of talked about over the last few weeks is the turf areas between the buildings and how tight these areas can become, especially on the north side of the building and um, whether we should um, be doing some sun studies, some sudden shade studies that uh, can, can be more impactful from a landscape standpoint. And that's certainly something that Kimley Horn can help with in that process as well, so that the development kind of um, withstands um, the elements, if you would. Uh, that's a, definitely a concern I could see in um, Texas and in Florida, if you've got grass in a spot that is really not getting a whole lot of sun really anywhere, then you really have some challenges. Um, you might need to replace that with a different material. So in summary, we talked a lot about we talked about a lot of different um, elements that impact the uh, development of these types of products in the marketplace from entitlements where we're talking about, you know, things like density and, and the timing that it takes to get through entitlements is, of course, you know, uh, time equals money. And then how does that relate back to code? Um, a good question I think we had is, is do we have uh, any examples of municipalities that have kind of started to write this into their, their codes? Um, that's something that uh, we can maybe chat a little bit more. Um, I have not seen any specific ones um, in the area that I work in. I have, I know that um, cities that are forward thinking are starting to think about it in their comp plans. And so they're starting to address their land use maps related to single family uh, residential. Um, but I haven't seen any cities actually rewrite their code to include a single family for rent product type yet. I don't know if Joseph or Lori has seen that um, to date in any of the projects they've worked on. Um, what I would maybe add is it, it's starting to pop up in maybe some draft ordinances mm -hmm. um, in, on the Addison, uh, part of the Addison ordinance and, and they're building in these new clauses. I don't think cities have actually adopted it. There might be, um, you know, in places like Austin where if they're, where it sort of fits into an existing zoning, um, that's, that's a little vague. So Salina um, and Addison, I think are a couple of examples that are working on it um, on a specific product like this. Yeah, and Salina was the one I was thinking of. They're incorporating yeah. it, I know, into their comp plan. Um, and I should mention too that these are um, Texas examples. 
we're the three of us on this call are primarily in the Texas market. Um, but we have folks nationwide that are working on this product from Florida to Arizona to um, to California across the state. So um, if we can go back one more slide, I just want to summarize a little bit more. I kind of jumped into questions because I thought it was a good time. But um, so we summarize by talking about entitlements. I mean, the, this is the perfect example of, you know, know the rules um, or change them. Um, what does it take to change them? And is that um, something you're you're willing to spend the time and effort and money to do? Is that, does that get you the um, end result that you're looking for? Site planning. Um, success is always planned. Um, so key to this is coordination. Uh, you saw the amount of detail that needs to be thought about even at the site planning stage. You need to have um, a consultant that is aware of all of these issues that could pop up when they're in that site planning stage and, and see um, what's the best and highest use for um, or uh, layout for the property that gets you to your end result. Grading and accessibility, this is one you want to stay inside the box for, so know your constraints and design to them. Again, this is a coordination and a code issue as well. Water and sanitary sewer, details matter, of course, you know, where you're going to lay that line, how that affects, affects the bottom line that Joseph talked about. This is getting into infrastructure, so um, time and money. You know, you don't want to waste a whole bunch of time doing one design when in the end result you've got to do something else. Um, Stormwater, basic don't flood your building. Um, we wanna make sure that we, we keep these buildings high and dry. And of course that's also related to time and money and, and um, code. So really the big thing that stands out in my mind across all of these is coordination. Uh, if I had one of these to pick, I would say coordination is key. You gotta start that early on when you're first starting this single family for rent product. And all of that coordination is gonna, in the end, help save some time and money on your part um, on the back end. So as I said, we've got partners across the nation. Um, like you saw on the, the slide that uh, showed up all of our Kimley Horn offices, we have a um, hundred offices nationwide. Um, and when you sign up for the webinar, you'll get a, um, a link after this uh, to that email that you put in that will take you to the website that shows um, a map and link to partners in your specific area. So if you're in Arizona looking for a single family for rent uh, partner, you could um, be able to um, track those folks down, down and have direct contact with them. It'll also have a link to this webinar and some more information um, related to the single family for rent product type. And so that um, I think concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us. We had a few more questions pop up during the presentation that we can field now. And then if any, if you guys have anything else that you'd like for us to address in this um, presentation, feel free to jump into the Q&A. Um, let's see. I think there was a question about, um, Joseph, I think you answered the infrastructure cost one pretty well. You know, that's that fluctuates, obviously, depending on what kind of infrastructure you're going to have to be implementing. Um, uh, the individual plat question, what obstacles do you see for developers who want the flexibility to plat individual lots for the option to sell the homes in the future? Um, I think from a planning standpoint, point, from a site planning standpoint, some of the challenges with that are related to what the city's gonna expect from a, a basically a single family development. This is basically gonna turn into a single family development in the future. So some of the benefits that you would get from doing a single family for rent product from the standpoint of, you know, are you able to do the private drives? Are you able to change the way that the stormwater, the, the um, current city codes are for um, engineering standards for roadways so that you can capture stormwater differently? Um, are you able to uh, front the lots differently? Um, those kinds of things are real um, important to keep in mind when you're going to sell the product later and when it becomes more of what the city might refer to as just a standard single family uh, development. I think they're gonna be really um, uh, more stringent with their current code uh, as opposed to being flexible with the uh, for rent product. What do you guys think? 
Any other thoughts on that, Joseph or Lori? No, I, yeah, I think it's, um, I've seen cities just hesitant to, to, to look at um, single family for rent on a lot by lot basis that could eventually be sold off um, and still view it as multifamily. I think they begin to apply more single family requirements. which means bigger lot sizes, public roads, um, or um, you know, treating it maybe a little more like townhomes as well, but. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Joseph, is there anyone that pops out in your mind that might be good to answer in this forum? And I will say that if we don't get to your question, um, we do have note of uh, who is asking the question. So we can field that question in an email at a later date. Um, feel free to reach out to either us or one of our partners, like I said, across the, the nation that can help you as well. Um, well, the uh, Kalia Jones asked about uh, the presence of an HOA with this type of development. And um, I think, again, if you go with the sort of the single family approach where you're trying to do individual lots. Um, I, I believe that there, there is probably more of an HOA role in trying to make sure that the group stays together and that it functions as one property. But if you instead are treating this as a multifamily development, then it's more of a property manager. And at that point, that's maybe something single family users may not be as familiar with is just making sure that you have a property manager to collect um, rent and, and sign people up, complete leases, um, service the amenities. It's, uh, that's probably someone on the multifamily side has a, a leg up or an advantage on just because um, you know, they're maybe used to the long-term hold and the challenges that come with that as opposed to a, a single sell. Just looking through the questions here to see um, any other ones we can answer on this forum. I think there was a question about amenities and how how are these amenities different from multifamily or master plan communities? Um, that's a, a pretty easy one I think we could capture before we have to end here, but um, Basically, they're very similar to a multi, it, well, it depends on the type. Uh, if you're looking at the cottage type community that we showed in this presentation, the amenities are very similar to a multifamily. We, you're, we're seeing uh, usually a pool structure. There might be a dog yard or a, um, a pooch park or something like that incorporated. Um, there's the benefit to these is different from multifamily is that, um, most of the time every unit has a has a yard space and so there may be less um, kind of open space that you, than what you would see in a multifamily development because there are those backyard spaces um, but there's generally one larger amenity that usually has a pool and um, maybe some small play equipment and again that depends on the product type um, the townhome and duplex might have less of an amenity uh, associated with them because their yards may be a little bit larger. It just kind of depends on the product type that's being developed. I think uh, that we're getting pretty close to four o'clock now. So we're gonna wrap up the presentation. Uh, I appreciate everybody uh, logging in and signing up for the webinar. Um, this has uh, truly been a great experience for all of us, and we hope that you've um, gained some, a little bit of knowledge and are maybe a little bit more interested in the single family for rent product. Again, if you've got any questions or if we weren't able to answer your question that you already had, or you have a question about a specific project, um, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help in whatever way we can.